Welcome to The Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hello everyone, welcome to this episode. Today's episode is a conversation with Isra Mahmoud. I am Egyptian. I currently live in Milan, Italy. Um, I am an assistant professor at Politecnico di Milano in the Department of Architecture and Urban Studies. Um, I have uh, been teaching and working on research in this department since 2018. Uh, Before that, I have um, researched on my PhD within uh, University of uh, Northeastern University in in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in collaboration program of uh, Marie Curie. Uh, RICE that was related to a topic on um, sociability of public spaces and my main research interests are related to cultural and green-based urban regeneration Um, and in this research topics I've been also teaching um, on courses of urban design and urban planning uh, within Politecnico and, and beyond for practitioners as well. In this episode, uh, we mostly talk about a project that she's been involved in the last couple of years, which is the Clever Cities Project, uh, an EU-funded living lab uh, slash research project that has been delivering nature-based solutions projects in three cities, London, Milan and Hamburg. So we talk about um, what that was about and the lessons learned. We talk about what are nature-based solutions, why are they important in cities, uh, the need to take a place-based approach to delivering them. Um, a concept called co-design by immersion with communities, this idea of, of really bringing communities in. And if you're involved at all in community engagement or co-design, uh, please do listen to that. That's a really interesting aspect of our conversation. And we also talk about uh, the governance of these types of initiatives, something that is often overlooked um, and that the research she's been doing shows there's maybe a sweet spot between a totally top-down approach and a totally grassroots approach um, where actually a lot of community action can sit inside a, a good uh, sort of governance framework um, to actually make it happen. And that's something that has been found in those three cities that they've been studying. Uh, we talk about, you know, some real projects um, uh, in this episode. So make sure to have a look at the visuals of that in the, in the uh, companion blog post in the Substack blog. So you can find that in the episode description. Just follow that link and uh, have a look at some of the visuals while you're listening. We should uh, enrich, the, enrich the experience for you. If you've enjoyed this episode, uh, please do uh, consider sharing it on social media or with some of your friends or colleagues. Um, I'm sure if you're enjoying it, you probably know someone else who will enjoy it. And that really helps uh, the podcast grow, but also helps to share these important conversations uh, and share the learnings from these, these projects. So thank you very much. Enjoy the conversation with Isra. Thank you so much, Isra, for joining me on the Green Urbanist podcast. It's really nice to have you. A question I'm starting to roll out um, with my guests is to tell us a bit about a place or a space that is special to you. I think one of the most uh, close to my heart places is uh, the North End Park and the Greenway of Boston. It's also known as the Rose Kennedy Greenway. It's in Massachusetts as well. The whole Greenway of uh, Rose Kennedy is a large-scale urban regeneration uh, that transformed a highway into a greenway. So, yeah, it has been changed as uh, land use. This has been a project that took the city of Boston a lot of money and a lot of time Mm, as well to transform this uh, normal highway into a covered highway and then transform also the um, the foreground of the land to a green um, mm. uh, greenway. So it's it's more of a green urban regeneration process, but it also had faced a lot of gentrification. There was a uh, lot of yeah. talk about this case when it popped up in the eighties and nineties. Uh, but I think the city of Boston is is took it, taking a lot of pride in this um, greenway specifically so yeah it's uh, interesting it's a special urban regeneration case study yeah i think it has a a combination of of food people arts um and some culture the ground as well so it's a perfect spot for human interaction which makes Hmm. 
my life as a researcher, <laughs> easier to observe people using the space and the encounters that happening at the same time. Indeed, I wrote a, I wrote a whole book about this. So <laughs> <laughs> um, um, in, in one of the, my latest publication, which is Placemaking for Green Urban Regeneration uh, in the Urban Book Series, <laughs> I introduce uh, this, start, this research uh, case study. And um, I have also introduced a method for measuring the topics of sociability and cultural ecosystem services. Uh, in public spaces when they are coupled with the placemaking approach. Uh, I have to say the truth, this work has been there more than eight years to consolidate mm -hmm. and publish as my latest monograph in 2022. However, um, I think it has been always one of the case studies that I loved and, and is really, really close to my heart. Great, great case study. And I hope maybe something we see happening in Europe and, and the UK more as we move away from uh, car dominated cities. But let's see, we can only hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so one of the main things I wanted to have you on to talk about is I've been, I've been following your research around the Clever Cities project, um, which mm -hmm. is this big, big European project. So can you can you just introduce that for us? Tell us a bit about it and then we'll sort of get into some of the details. Yep. So uh, the Clever Cities project is a Horizon uh, 2020 project. Uh, it has been funded from the European Union under the Innovation uh, Action Program under the Grant Agreement 776604. And with this uh, project, um, not just the city of Milan, but also Hamburg and London are making nature-based interventions in key districts in their cities. Uh, aiming for like urban regeneration, of course, but within the exchange of this, of the, between the cities, inclusive collaboration and multidisciplinary learning is happening. So the Clever Cities project aims to drive this kind of nature-based urban transformation, mm. uh, mainly for socially inclusive cities across Europe. Uh, we also have follower cities from Latin America and China. Uh, so uh, three frontrunner cities, six fellow cities, uh, all this consortium are coming together to drive uh, a, a new perspective that the communities are the main um, local teams that could include citizens, businesses, partners, knowledge partners, authorities. And these, what we call urban innovation partnerships, uh, can drive what is the Clever Cities. This collaboration structure is, is as well open and inclusive to, mm. to local leads. So doing urban regeneration, but more on using socially inclusive processes. Um, my role in Clever Cities has been on researching what we call the co-creation of nature-based solutions um, guide guidance. Uh, since 2018, when I started working in Politecnico di Milano, um, I have been in, involved in um, designing the methodologies and the practices um, and the different forms of collaboration, the different uh, tools for implementation of this collaboration, uh, and what we call the uh, co-creation pathway. There was, there is a whole website <laughs> <laughs> on creation of nature-based solutions guidance. Um, and in this guidance, uh, it was divided on two parts. The first part is mainly looking at the theory and the different methods behind. How do we do co-creation of nature-based solutions? What is the added value of co-creation uh, of nature-based solutions? The, the first part not just looks at that, but also looks at how do we measure the different um, impacts? How do we, what we call in urban planning co-benefits of nature-based mm. solutions? And that was the first part. The second part, was mainly looking at the different tools and methods that we can use. And we also provide uh, templates on, on how these tools and methods could be used within different cities. One of the privileges that we had in Clever is that we have a uh, different spatial context. The city of London is definitely different than the city of Milan mm. and the city of Hamburg. So when you have different spatial containers and you have different uh, uses to deal with in different communities, different cultural um, and different backgrounds on, on how to deal with your local community and different languages. This was one of the major, of course, uh, topics that we talked all the time. You definitely need um, 
like place based methods we need you mm. need something that is built up for this community you need to bring people and increase their sense of ownership around your your case study um so that is mainly what uh, my role within the clever cities but if you if you have any other questions yeah i have i definitely have lots of follow up questions just really interesting points to to pick up on and i think maybe useful for the audience um, if we go back to this term nature based solutions because it's something that has become popular recently and i think people maybe use the term in different ways uh, you see it popping up all of, all over the place so what for this purpose for this context what what is nature based solutions <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, so nature based solutions as a concept uh, developed since um, 2015 let's say since the first publication by the european commission um on on um is i think it was uh the topic of renaturing it was called mm. the document itself was called renaturing with cities and um and since then there has been a lot of development to the concept that is mainly coming from academia and also coming from practice so in the latest um united nations environment assembly in March 2022, nature based solutions were redefined as, again as actions to protect, conserve, restore, and sustainably use and manage natural resources or modified terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems. I think the addition of terrestrial and freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems that because a lot of new projects came in here that they were not considered before mm-hmm. on the research streams of nature based solutions. Um, however, in the general understanding, nature based solutions as well address social, economic, and environmental challenges effectively and adaptively. In this sense, we aim to simultaneously provide human well being, ecosystem services, and resilience and biodiversity benefits. So, um, in this sense, nature based solutions come as a huge container for different mm. actions uh, that are under the umbrella of ecosystem services that are actions to adapt and mitigate what we have uh, in terms of climate change. And I think in in this sense, maybe I could also give a reflection on Clever Cities again. Um, When we started Clever Cities project, this definition was not up. However, a general strategy for implementing nature-based solutions was adopted, given their potential to deliver a wide range of of the socioeconomic benefits and services while we still combat climate change. So um, in our case of Clever Cities, we focused more on what we call Clever Action Labs. And Mm. they are the traditional form of what academia calls urban living labs. Um, Within this Clever Cities context, uh, in more exhaustive words, they are uh, figurative or physical containers where uh, social innovation happening in Clever in the spatial context could happen. So the urban living labs are the spaces where the implementation of nature-based solutions happen in real life within this Clever Cities project. When when we think about the the difference, for instance, what is uh, London is doing in their urban living labs or what we call Clever Action Labs or Milan, is the difference is that we have um, two big neighborhoods. In the case of London, we have Thames Meet. Uh, in the case of Milan, we have Giambellino. And the two different neighborhoods, not they are really, really different, not just in the terms of social mm. structure, but also in terms of community building. We, in, in Milan, um, specifically, I will talk about this because I've been following these activities since 2018, um, we started co-designing with the community, the, the community park that we have in Giambellino 129. So we started designing with the community what we needed, what they needed to see, what they needed to feel. Um, and this is the methodology that we used for the co-creation pathway. Um, I don't know if you had any other questions about the co-creation and Clever Cities in this sense. Well, I think it would be really interesting maybe to dive into that Milan project and, and what you've been doing there and maybe pull out for us what what were what was the sort of co-design element of that and what were the outcomes i think that would be really interesting to hear yeah so um 
In, in Milan, we have three urban living labs. Uh, we have one on overall the city that is uh, Rinverdiamo Milano, which is focusing on green roofs and walls around the city. Um, this project has been running as well on um, providing participatory, participatory uh, campaign that involved developing uh, a mix of actions and tools and raising awareness on nature-based solutions, uh, exchanges of practices and tech co-design and pilot projects within the um, different parts of the city. So we have an implementation uh, on four green roofs and walls within the city within the lifetime of the Clever Cities project in Milan. Uh, the second um, urban living lab is the Giambellino 129, which is was mainly focusing on working together with citizen experimentation of forms of co-creation and co-design uh, in this uh, community park in the neighbor in Giambellino neighborhood. Um, when we think about this case study of John Bellino specifically, um, it's a very contested um, place. It, it has a variety and mix of uh, societal um, social demographics, um, different chunks, and also has a um, wide range of foreigners that live in this uh, neighborhood. So while we, and also high age range of, of, um, of society. So we have a specific context where we have to be very, very careful when we are doing activities related to co-creation and co-design in order to avoid digital divide. Mm. When you have elderly people, you don't want to make them, or vulnerable communities anyway, you don't want to make them uh, out of the context so you start being there for them. Um, that's why in, in this case, um, we introduced the method of what we call co-design by immersion. Mm. Um, mm. In this co-design by emergent activities, we started testing um, a methodology for co-designing in uh, whereas the space users are experiencing this immersion within the place. So before the project, uh, when we started regenerating the land um, in 2019, before that, we have done the sessions of the co-design at the same place where the community park is going to be happening. So this was the idea of co-design by immersion. And then you start asking people, what do they like to see? What do they like to feel? Mm. What do they feel in the space? What do, what do they want to hear? So a lot of people came out with the, you know, bird shipping or they want to hear, they want to see more butterflies. And then we started changing our design to match with more natural elements. And that was something that was really, really nice in, in, sen in a sense that, you change your perspective as a designer, as an urban planner, to match with what is the community wants. So this was really one of the um, clever experiences in Milan. The third action lab, uh, before I forget, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> is a new um, is a new station. It's a new green, uh, what we call green uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's uh, the Tibaldi station has already opened to the public. Uh, it's um, it's a station that is connecting on the Milan Circle Line. It's connecting um, the south uh, of the city. And uh, our work mainly related to this station, how do we how did we approach implementing uh, nature based solutions, was related to uh, two green walls around the station exits and um, green noise barriers that are next to the station as well to um, help reduce the noise coming from the trains uh, around this neighborhood. And there's also a public space, a small public space is what we call the green oasis, a green small public space where we started to design the space according to results coming from a huge survey that we have done with the citizens and residents of this area. When we have done this, we came up with this the residents came up with different ideas related to what do they want to see in the space. Uh, also, so in terms of the different activities that so we have in this space, we have areas for seating, we have areas for reading, and we also have uh, shaded areas and, and green elements. So um, that was also a result of the process of co-creation with the citizens in this neighborhood. So um, I think the experience of Clever Cities overall uh, either in Milan or other cities, because there's the same as as Milan. They also there's also stories from Hamburg and London that mm. 
maybe someone else can tell. <laughs> but um, I believe that uh, the experience, the overall experience from working with a co-creation process and pathway um, along, a, 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 like throughout five or more years of a project is that you learn from the process. What I call mm. learning by doing um, approach is, is that we, you approach um, a rigid element of urban design, such as like designing a space or um, furniture, or, um, like urban furniture and so on, as well as nature. You bring that to a space and then you start thinking, what would people that live in this neighborhood think about it? So you start looking at the process differently. And when you do that, you have then the perspective of like, oh my God, I didn't think about this. Why did not this is, did not <laughs> my mind? So you start, you know, researching. Um, you start looking at the things differently. So that was mainly um, one very good experience in, in, in this. And we also learned a lot about how do we um, impose a collaborative governance or a shared governance process. So mm. when we do that, it's, it really aims at, you know, improving the public procedures of how do we think of involving citizens in, in this sense. So, yeah. What, what, what a fantastic project. And I just, I love that idea of co-design by immersion. Um, I think it's, I've been involved with a fair amount of community engagement, um, you know, as part of be, being a practitioner. And I think the challenge is always that you're, you're asking people, people, members of the general public, you're sort of expecting them to have the skills of a planner or a designer in that they, they need to be able to read plans and they need to be able to sit in a room and talk about these things in the abstract. But mm -hmm. it's, it's not really fair to expect people to be able to do that. So bringing them out onto the site and saying, like, just tell us what you what you want to feel here, what you want to see. I think that is fantastic. And yeah. it sounds like a really worthwhile um, thing yeah. to do. Yeah. Did was there any challenges with? I mean, you mentioned that it's it's quite a diverse neighborhood. Did you have challenges with different members of the community, like tr trying to pull the d the design in different directions, and you as a designer having to sort of try and keep everyone happy? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. We we had um, a facilitator, like mm. what we call the the design facilitator, is um, a person that is uh, doing the. In, in Clever Cities, we have a lot of partners in Milan, but yeah. that was the role that was uh, one of the partners leading um, to facilitate the sessions on co-design and, and co-creation within the community. When you have this kind of, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, um, conflicts, you tend to, um, to want to make everyone happy and you cannot do that in, in, in <laughs> some ends. And at some point you have to pull out and say, okay, so for technical reasons, you cannot do that. I don't want to be mean here. Um, but this, this is true. One of the, yeah, one of the urban living labs that we had, we tried to make sure that, you know, we want to make everyone starting from the gray old lady till the people, small children, you know, running around this neighborhood to be happy. However, this took extra time rather than mm. the ones that we, we instead of planning for for four um, co-design workshops or meetings, we started planning for five, and then you add extra time on the project. That is something that we happens all the time. Uh, one of the things also related to digital divide is that when you bring elderly people to the co-design sections and co-design workshops, sometimes you need to to deal with their general understanding of you know with the problems that are beyond just the the day day to day problems sure, uh, yeah. such things related to climate change or related to you know when we're trying to set up a process of a shared governance it's an important aspect why we are doing that what is the added value of doing co-creation and co-design so it's it's not that simple question of like where do you want to see the street it's something beyond that and so uh, yeah it has been a lot of challenges um, but in the case of Milan, we have been so much faithful that what we are trying to do is really, really to approach the community, make, make it work for everyone. So, yeah, yeah great. And, and, who, and who were the partners involved? 
um, this sort of make this happen? In in all Milan or <laughs> or well, all let's, let's take okay. the Giambolino uh, example. Um, okay. Who who was sort of leading on that? And we have uh, the municipality of Milan, which is Comune di Milano. Uh, Fondazione del Politecnico di Milano, which is also related to Politecnico di Milano, where I work. Um, and then Ambient Italia, that is an uh, environmental agency. The WWF, uh, that is International Environmental Agency. Uh, we have uh, AMAT, which is an agency for mobility and um, environmental and territorial transportation in Milan. Uh, RFE, which is uh, Rete Ferrovia Italiana, which is related to the general transportation lines uh, in mm. Milan, and Iliante, that is an NGO that is related to the uh, envir- environmental as well as the socio-cultural implementation of regeneration processes. So that was the NGO responsible of the facilitation in, in this case. Um, but yeah, we we have the thing is that we are a large team with different experiences and different expertise. And when we we just started doing this process. It was it was exhausting doing a lot of meetings with everyone. So we started redesigning our own governance of this group and start to you know track it down to different experiences, different work packages. What we call work packages in the project is that the, these people are doing the environmental monitoring. These people are doing the mm. co-design. These people are doing this and this work and that. But however, we have been cross collaborating all the time. So I. I don't think we have, we have been working together very nicely. So yeah, this is the last year of the project. So everyone is getting emotional that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're finishing this together. So yeah, it's, it's like seeing the, the, um, when you're running a marathon and you're seeing the end line <laughs> yeah. and you're just like, yeah, we well, want to make it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that's, that's interesting. And that it's sort of, you know, it, it's very hard to often convince clients and and private developers and even local authorities in in the UK who have very limited budgets to really put the time and money into into like a mm-hmm. very in-depth co- co-creation or engagement process so it sounds like the fact that this was EU funded gave it that extra boost to make it work I wonder, yeah, do, do yeah, you have definitely. any um do you have any thoughts on sort of making the case for doing this level of of code design how to how would you try and convince someone who's skeptical about it i suppose oh um that's that's a very good question what we have been trying what we have been asked by the european commission in march 2020 specifically when the pandemic situation uh and the emergency uh, started in milan is to try to track down what is the added value of what we call co-creation processes mm. so um we as Politecnico, myself and, and Eugeni Morello, Professor Eugeni Morello from Laboratorio di Simulazione Urbana in Politecnico, where I work, uh, we started elaborating um, a co-creation uh, process indicators framework. It's it's very complex and very scientific. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be, sound like a nerd here. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's a uh, it's a methodology that is got developed mm-hmm. along the lines of trying to understand what is the added value of doing shared governance, what okay. is the added value of doing co-design, and what is the added value like in terms of environmental, social, and cultural values. And in this process, we have, especially the parts related to shared governance, we started dividing our framework on different levels of engagement. So we have all the uh, Arnstein 1969 um, letter of participation, we have the inform, Mm. involved, empower, and so on. Um, And when we started asking cities what are their indicators of success, what what are the indicators that they could tell us they could measure for their shared governance processes, it was really hard work. Um, we started doing that in, in 2020. We have set different milestones. The last milestone is the one upcoming in, in May, around May or June this year. Uh, and this is the third and last uh, validation for our framework. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see how do we uh, evaluate um, a shared governance process or a co-creation process from the city's perspective and from the citizens' perspective. Mm. 
So what mm. we did was to put together these different indicators. Um, it's a, I really don't want to sound nerd, but it's <laughs> what we have been trying <laughs> is to put together these different indicators and try to understand their different uh, levels. So we have macro indicators, things that happen at the level of the municipality. We have micro indicators, things that happen at the scale of the citizen or the neighborhood. Mm. Um, and then when, when we have put this, these two levels together, we have then been trying to evaluate them. So you need to transform any kind of indicator into either qualitative or quantitative uh, type. So, and then evaluate that based on their, you know, citizens engagement. Uh, how do they feel about the in, being informed or being engaged or being empowered? The outcomes of this process is really, really interesting because the first step was to check if the cities have the same, uh, you know, layout. And it, it was not. <laughs> Each city has their own sets of indicator. And that was really, really one of the things that, when we started figuring out, it's like, oh, it's it's really interesting to see that you have given the three municipalities, London, Milan, and Hamburg, the same exact steps to follow, and rather they have different outcomes. So it's really, really <laughs> interesting in this sense. Yeah. Um, we, we have wrote um, an article uh, about the nine action labs of Clever. Uh, and and we are comparing the three urban living labs of Milan with the three ones of Hamburg and with the three ones of London. And it's really, really interesting to see how not just the different cities behaved differently to the same mm. creation pathway steps, but also the um, related to their own objectives. So what we did with this um, research is that we have set uh, a process of what we call theory of change we started measuring the expected outputs and outcomes from the cities within four years. And surprise, you have totally different out, out objectives. Like we are talking about biodiversity in one place and we're talking about social cohesion in another. Mm -hmm. So there are two different outcome, outcomes. And when you're looking at this, it's like you need different process. You need different mm -hmm. perspectives. You need different mindset and paradigm shift how to approach nature-based solutions and how to implement this with citizens and, and communities and local authorities with the idea that you want to engage everyone. You want to share the governance of this process with everyone. So there's no one size fits all in this process. And, and what we learned along the lines that the collaborative governance and the engagement of stakeholders across this project of five years lifetime is never the same. So that's why when mm. we start thinking, it's like, oh, we need to evaluate how this, you know, comparative study happened and so on and so forth. So it's really interested where you also not just compare the process, but also compare the urban living labs at the end as, as a possible, you know, container for the process itself. So the Urban Living Labs is a place-based, you know, vehicle for how this regeneration happened. And then you figure out it's like, this is leading to innovation. This is, mm. when you change your local governance structure, it leads to innovation. How this transformation within this five years helped as well the cities understand that they should focus more on biodiversity or they should focus more on, you know, social cohesion in some neighborhoods. So it's really, really something that I, I get enthusiastic about this all the time. So if, if you can keep on asking me questions, I will just go <laughs> ahead on that. So, yeah, so that's, I mean, I think it really points towards the strength of uh, being process focused rather than outcome focused. Because yeah. I think you, mm -hmm. you, might, you might come as a designer or as a local government with an idea of what a place needs as an outcome. But actually, mm -hmm. if you follow this process with the co-design, and, and take, taking that broad view of what nature-based solutions might be, actually, presumably, the outcome would be totally different to what a single designer may have come up with. Yep. And yep, be much, much better uh, suited to the local area and for the community. So, yeah, that's very, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, it's rather, uh, how to say, it's, um, you know, open-minding. You, you, you start mm. thinking about, like, as a designer, where I always come back to myself and, you know, you, you start thinking about your, your work 
outside your work and, and not just on the topic of writing and articles about nature-based solutions and shared governance, but you you start thinking about the effectiveness of what you're doing to the people. And then uh, what I did when in this summer, last summer, um, was to go and observe how people behave around one of the green walls that we have in uh. the neighborhood of Giambellino. And it was really, really interesting. You start seeing people, um, they cross the street, they go on the other side, they start <laughs> observing the green wall, and then they aesthetically like it, they admire it. And then when you start, you go and talk with them, you know that this you know, green wall is here because it also gives benefits to the environment. It's also an environmental solution and so on and so forth. And you know, you start telling them more about the Clever Cities project. And there's like, oh, no, I didn't know about this. I've been resident in this neighborhood since five years, but I never, you know, expected something like this to happen in my neighborhood. Right. So it, it's like more the Yimby effect, but without doing the Yimby effect. So it's really <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, this is, this is very something that I can relate to as an urban designer when I come back again to my research and to my, you know, interest in placemaking, how to bring communities around what we are doing as an urban designer is really, really interesting in this sense. So, yeah, I see myself in this all the time. So I, I think um, I think you mentioned before that um, some people were stealing plants from the green wall as well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, one, one of the observations that we had, we have to um, observe uh, things related to aspects related to not just to the use of space, but also to safety, security, vandalism, and so on. Um, uh, besides the environmental, of course, indicators on thermal comfort and so mm. on. So, but, it, so, but um, so I, d I don't want to really, really navigate into that. But uh, <laughs> one of the things that we have seen during the observations this summer, um, two small acts of vandalism were like, old ladies just go and steal seeds from the small plants that are over there. It's like, okay, you can do this. Just don't ruin the wall. Um, or maybe one, uh, you know, after, after a Saturday night, it's normal to find a, um, a Pepsi can that is over there. It's one of, in one of the pockets. It's really funny. It means that people do use the space, but just differently. So sure. <laughs> it's it just it's just it's nice but in in comparison to um, to other green walls that we have in milan and we any green walls around any cities that is on the street level uh, that is not elevated um it is not uh the the wall has not suffered from any vandalism mm -hmm. actions so far so we're really happy about it and we're trying to monitor if there are any um, outsider behavioral um, things that are happening that, that are not the norm. But we did not see anything um, bad or something happening yeah, so far. Yeah. Hopefully not. <laughs> That's good. That's not good in sign. the future. <laughs> uh, but before, before I forget and before we move on, um, about the, the Giambellino Park, yes. um, mm -hmm. has that been built out? Or can you tell us a bit about what the design the final design was for that. Oh, you, you mean the Giambellino wall or the park? They are two different projects. Oh, is there? Um, okay, cool. So what, what? tell us about the park. Uh, so the Giambellino 129 is the is the community park where we have done all the co-design by immersion workshops and where yeah. we involve the community. We have um, a physical uh, urban living lab over there with the, that is managed within um, uh, Milo Lab, that is a community, that is association, that is from the community, local community mm. associations that is managing this. Uh, we, the community, the park now is in the process of being built. So we are doing the, um, the land re rehabilitation and so on. So we finished the design with the community. We got it approved. It took a lot of time because of the COVID situation so mm. that was one of the things one of the unexpected things as well is that some parts of the execution drawings the designs it's, uh, itself had to change related to when they started digging they figured out there was a uh, electrical um, uh, okay. um, cable that is uh, 
underneath, so they couldn't change that, and they had they had to change a little bit of the design. So it's something that it really, really took a lot of time, but it's now on the construction phase. Um, the wall was um, done with the private partners uh, from from Milan, and uh, and they they got it funded at par- as part of their corporate social responsibility. Uh, or the ATM is the Agency di Trasporti Milanesi, um, and this agency is a public agency. Uh, and uh, the private, they they got the money to do this wall, but the private partner from uh, from the Consortium of Milan helped with the design of this mm. uh, of this wall. So um, it's it's it has been a process that took not that much time in terms of. Uh, of doing it, but rather the um, the design itself that, you know, to make it appealing for everyone. So we started with small parts of the wall and then we enlarged to the, um, just to make sure that, you know, the design could help and, and make it work. So yeah, there, there are two different experiences, but um, what is definitely measurable here is that people, the more we have nature, in our cities, the more we like it, the more we see it, the more we like it, the more we want more. So it, it it's bringing us to 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 nature. We we want to see more nature in our cities. Definitely after the COVID and after mm. um, the pandemic situation. So yeah, that is that's something. interesting. Yeah, and maybe <clears throat> maybe we're we're moving towards more naturalistic landscape designs away from sort of that formal formal landscape approach. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, I was going to, so I, I read one of your papers talking about governance. Um, again, I, I had a look at one of your papers um, earlier and you, you, where you were assessing the, um, the governance of the, the living labs. And one of the points that was made was that there's a sort of sweet spot, sweet, sweet spot between fully top down and fully grassroots where mm-hmm. these things seem to work really well. So like, like a lot of community action but within a sort of structure of a formal of a formal um you know government structure or agency or something can you talk a little bit about that because that's that's quite interesting yeah um what we did was uh is that is evaluating um the different processes of co-creation uh in comparative study between uh what has happened in Milan what has happened in London and what has happened in Hamburg um in in this uh paper specifically we have been trying to analyze how did we move from a totally top down uh which is uh, how did the clever cities project start mm-hmm. and um with a fully uh, bottom up how did we as well have um all the communities, grassroots movement, the communities without having, you know, the specific organization and so on and so forth, uh, coming together to um, to have this work. So, in this uh, publication specifically, we we have looked at this uh, different governance models, what we call integrated collaborative governance approach uh, for urban transformation. At the end, we we have this yeah what you call the sweet spot is is the middle ground um what we have figured out from this analysis and all the detailed models that we when we started actually comparing not just the um, <clears throat> the talking about this is what we had figured out is that um the the collaborative governance process or the shared governance process go through three different stages the initiation of the process where you have the totally top down and where the decisions are making are more technical are more not just from a top down perspective but are they also they have very small inputs from the community mm. and then they transform that into a consultation process where you informally start bringing um, citizens and and different associations and local groups into into the process and then where the network of this becomes more stable in this phase, you are phase you are mainly looking at transforming, orchestrating a little bit of the procedure where, and then you you're like you have the boom unlocking the the organizational processes, and 
after this or unlocking, you have the designing and the orchestration of this networks and then the mobilization phase. In this mobilization phase, you will start seeing partners that are not part of the process. They are not getting the money as beneficiaries, but they are coming in because they want to take part. Mm. Uh, they have seen something that is really appealing for them and then they start coming in. So such as in the case of um, Cambellino 129 Green Wall, the, the, the agency of ATM was not part of the process. They started coming in when they have mm. seen the campaign that we have done on raising awareness of nature-based solutions and they liked the process, so they came in. So that was uh, something that is happening. And then for this wide-reaching reach, engagement, you start seeing new governance processes forming out around the main, and then you start consolidating this network. So this is exactly what we have done in terms of analysis in this uh, research article, and we started analyzing what happened in Hamburg, London, and Milan. Mm-hmm. Um, we start drawing as well <laughs> the different models, uh, this was uh, the, the as they are depicted in in the actual case. What we are trying to to say at the end of this uh, article is uh, the sweet spot of finding your each city has found their own balance in in mm. one of these governance models. Uh, the at, at the end they all happened where you are in between the top down and bottom up we have drawn around 20 different governors we have drawn them and we have drawn around these 20 different shapes of these governance models and how do you know you change from more uh, leading position to a local position and so on and then at the end you end up in the middle in the three cities so what we concluded with is that even if you have the possibilities of creating you know multi-actor, multi-governance, multi-levels of this collaborative governance process, at the end you seek the integration. At the end you seek the point where the, the, um, the integration of the different players of the governance process come together. Mm. And you, when this happens, you strengthen what your existing nodes and you help designing new, new nodes um this this research has has been more onto the consolidation phase since I think we have been working on this since more than um, three years uh, as as a research. So at the end we we figure out that you know you readapt, you change along the pathway, the change is normal. The diversity of the stakeholders that you have is normal. Um, and the clever cities project has the fortune to be um, an opportunity. To, to understand how these different, you know, relationships work. And um, this has been something that, yeah, we have been also researching in um, the Task Force 6, uh, where I am actually also part. Uh, the Task Force 6 is a task force that is led by the European Commission, Network Nature. Uh, and in this task force uh, group, uh, we are representative of different European projects, mainly in this case, our Clever Cities and Urbanet project, as the main uh, projects coming from 2018. And we have been uh, leading um, a, a research uh, on uh, how do the co-creation processes uh, worked uh, simultaneously in from different perspectives and from different um, different also case studies. So Clever Cities has Milan, London, and Hamburg, while Urbinat has also Portugal and other cities. Mm-hmm. Um, and that what we're trying to do here is to give, you know, perspectives to new projects. Uh, what we are writing now is is mainly looking at how the can you the new projects can work together to make the collaborative governance or also to make the co-creation process of nature based solutions work. Uh, because it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge that you do not figure out from day one. Yeah, because yeah. You figure it out, you know, in the second or the third year that you want to bring everyone to the table. You want to talk with your community. And when you want to do that as a challenge of, of nature-based solutions is that you need to not talk technical language with your local community. Um, when you don't want to do this, you need to ask them first, what do they want? And mm. that takes the process to another 
layer of identifying and mapping needs of your stakeholders before putting in the policy that you want to adapt as a nature-based solution. So it's, it is something that is always changing. It's really, really dynamic as a process. Um, and, and in what I, what I figured out at the end of this, um, I'm now close to finishing this. So <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> um, the project is still running till, uh, September. So, um, but yeah, we, we are have few deadlines coming up. <laughs> um, we figured out is that we came with the thing that we did not see that nature itself could become one of our stakeholders. Mm. Um, in this case, we started looking at, you know, we have always talked about, even within our co-creation toolkits and the guidance that we have provided, we have talked about nature as an element that we bring to the design. But what we figured out after four and a half years or more is that we have been witnessing that the increase in integration of this nature into our process of planning and design and practices, um, people become more sensitive uh, and, and they want to see more. They want to have more nature to our cities. So in our attempt, we wanted to bring more um the perspective of nature as a stakeholder, so as a new understanding of nature, the, the plant life, the plant elements, the democratic life of, of plants and so on. Um, and also the, the, the topics related to ecosystem services and these services and the recognition of nature and rights of nature as a legal status is, is also a long way to go. But in a more, <clears throat> let's say, scientific and empirical evidence uh we argue that the practice is to be of nature including nature as a stakeholder in in our planning and design still needs more research we still we still need still needs more understanding of the moral status and of the non-human species um in this sense bringing this role of nature as a stakeholder in different governance mechanisms such as consultation, participation, decision-making, and so on, will still need a lot of time. And this appointment of people representing nature as well in different uh, co-creation activities, we do a very nice activity on, on role-playing. And then if you do this with like um, children, it's really, really nice when you see mm -hmm. them, they want to be a flower or they want to be a bee, and that is really something that is an emergent mechanism, of course. It's of a role-playing of emergent mechanism. But it is something that you then reflect on and say, oh, I did not think about that again. So that's a new input to my design process uh, that, you know, a bee or a butterfly or a flower would want to be part of the process. And that is really, really something that we, we, we are now looking at for as as researchers in nature as a stakeholder but that's a future design <laughs> that's a future research project that i still wanted to work on so <laughs> i have i cannot disclose any more information <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fantastic i love that and i think i think uh, you know concepts like ecosystem services and nature-based solutions have been criticized for being anthropocentric there, mm -hmm. there's a risk that we still view nature as being something we can deploy for for our benefit and mm -hmm. i love that that this process has taken it beyond that and says wait what does need what does nature need from us and what mm -hmm. what can yeah. we give just for the benefit of you know you know trees aren't just there to trap pollution and absorb carbon you know we sh you know what what we need to be thinking about what they need and what the, what they need to thrive as well and I, I i love that that's coming into these formal processes so yeah yeah it's uh I, I still have to say that it takes time. We sure. we have been we have been lucky enough to to um, to do that within the clever city framework. But my research also on nature based solutions for sustainable urban planning goes beyond clever cities and and uh, having a container for research is really uh, nice. Yet you also figure out that you your limitations are the case that is mm. they are this. I need to go beyond. So that's where we 
um, where we figured out that we need to do go beyond and talk about greening cities, shaping cities is, is something that we have also done in 2022. Uh, in 2020, and then a lot of publications followed on, on on how do we think about the greening cities, um, urban strategies, the greening urban strategies as a driver, as a vehicular movement to towards the also the EU biodiversity strategy 2030. How mm. do we bring people to engage with the the urban nature based solutions and and the biodiversity? So it's a momentum. I think it's in research and in practice where you start figuring out those like this is going beyond. You need to think beyond the diff- the specific case study and then think about how you go forward in this. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. And I, I've been doing. I think what what we haven't touched on, but I think is 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 hopefully is clear to people is is the importance of of. Uh, nature nature and urban nature in adapting to climate change and that kind of thing yeah. so i suppose it's worth it's worth sort of re- reiterating that point of saying like this there, there was a, a study published just i think this week uh from um some researchers in barcelona that was saying that they they looked at um uh a number of european cities and they found that an increase in tree cover of 30 percent could have reduced uh mortality during a heat wave by also by 30% by one third. So there's lots of evidence coming out of this, this real importance of, um, you know, for our health and for, for saving lives actually of, of, of these nature-based solutions. So um, yeah, well, I've, I've definitely talked about that in other podcasts as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it's becoming a momentum and I totally understand that, but uh, there's also mm. uh, an in- very interesting publication that came actually three days ago. It's on global mapping of urban nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation. It's a nature sustainability journal, so it's it's really quite booming now all over mm. the, the scientific discourse, but it's giving us um, a direction where is the where is the the future trends of nature-based solutions? Where do we see that uh, based on different nature-based solutions types? So we have the water, we have the ecosystem-based adaptation, and how these different trends are matching with what we are trying to do in terms of climate change. How can this distribution of nature-based solution help with the, you know, spatial distribution, help with the reducing uh, sensitivity to climate change or supporting the adaptive capacities or the raising, rising t- temperature and droughts and so on and so forth of problems related to climate change. The, the importance of this study, I think it's, it's besides it's giving a global perspective because they're analyzing actually continents, not just cities or are oh, right. b- b- um, different um, countries, uh, but they are looking at the global, so they have all the con- uh, continents, um, and then they are looking at the social capacity and the technical capacity uh, for nature-based solutions to transform, uh, the overall distribution as well of the capacity. So they are looking at ecological, social, technical, and the overall ones. It's really interesting, and as a case study, as as a publication, and I, I warmly um, suggest that people interested in nature based solutions could, you know, look at that, especially aspects related to climate change adaptation. Um, just uh, my uh, here, my hint is that when it comes technical to nature based solutions, it's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of yeah you you see you see a lot of people talking about data collection you see a lot of people talking about i do this myself so i cannot complain but um <laughs> in in my um research i also look at social uh frameworks and social analysis and how can we um include people in the process and also how do we can we do statistics related to social demographics and social cohesion in relationship to nature based solutions when it goes to more environmental and more ecosystem adaptation topics it becomes more technical and when it becomes more technical people get scared of yes, seeing yeah, numbers yeah. and data so <laughs> not for a scientist but for normal people so I don't want listeners to of this podcast to you know to get scared of what we're talking about. So it's it's really something nice, and uh, um, I just hope that you know it everyone can understand um, the the importance of nature beyond the technicalities. 
that is something. Yeah. That... Yeah. And I think it, it's something I'm keen for this podcast to do is to be a bit of a, a translator for people yep. so that, you know, at least yeah. it's, it's, you can listen to you say it and talk about it in plain English and not have to worry about, <laughs> you know, seeing all the, uh, the difficult numbers, but, yep. um, yep. Mo- mo- moving, moving on to sort of our, our, our final points, um, you, you put out a poll on your LinkedIn, which thank you yep. for doing. And it's definitely something I'm going to do again in the future when I have, <laughs> when I have guests on again. Uh, and you're asking people what, what, what particular topics um, they would like to hear you talk about. And two things came up, which is really interesting, which you might want to, to touch on. Um, one is the futures of nature-based solutions. And the other is technology, like augmented reality in, within nature-based solutions. So, so what about those? Yep. Yeah, I, I have to say that um, it was the first time for me as well to put up the poll. So it was interesting to see that how do people that follow me on LinkedIn um, see my research, for, you know, seeing what you're doing from other people's perspective. Yeah. So the main main points came, of course, related to nature, climate change and nature, social impact and nature and so on. But then I got two very interesting comments on the futures where, where is the future research and academia and not just this, but also the practice of nature-based solutions? Where is this going? Um, so that, what, that was something that I was like, oh, that, that is very interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's also something that um, I have looked at with uh, Professor Fabiano Lemis from, as well from Politecnico di Milano. We, we do have a special issue in a futures journal it's a scientific journal that is looking at the relationship, the future of relationship between human and nature in urban environmental planning, mm. design and practice. So what we're trying to do in this special issue is to connect with the, with the intersection between this environmental sciences and, and planning and this debate between positioning nature-based solutions in our future and effectiveness of nature-based solutions. Um, this this is not a new thinking. It's it's called now nature based thinking. It it came in twenty twenty more. Uh, it's also related to biophilic design that I have seen that you have done another podcast on. So it's more the development of the of the research aspect, the future of this. So more than human approach. How do we look at the multi species justice from our perspective and and other perspectives? So. These future studies can also provide novel ideas, critical ideas, reflective questions about the sorts of future and, and nature relationship that we want to we want to give voice of, of the imagining and implementing nature-based solutions in our future. So we're looking at these aspects from a co-evolutionary scenario in, in terms of how do we implement that in cities. So yeah, this was one of the points that came. And I'm really, really, um, uh, I was surprised. <laughs> I did not think that, you know, people would want to hear about that. The other topic related to, um, to, to what people want to hear was the um, technology. How can the technology embedding, the, you know, technologies for improving uh, the nature-based solutions performance and the fostering social inclusion in, in different greening strategies that was something as well that we did last year. Uh, like we, we started uh, looking at uh, Clever Cities in, in collaboration with another European project, VAR Cities. Uh, we started looking at um, this topic and how can technology in green, implementing technologies in, in the nature-based solutions process and technology for green, the different perspectives of technologies. What are the different types of sensors how can we use them and how can we use the technology to improve the performance of nature-based solutions? And on the other hand, the technology for green, the different platforms, the different mm. mobile applications, the different um, perspectives, also usage of robotics and artificial intelligence. And, in, in, you know, now you have all these sensors that could tell you that this um, plant needs water. So you start by giving them water and so on and so forth. So we started doing this research on how can we evaluate um, the different taxonomies of of technology in green, for green, to have more feedback on nature-based solutions again and improving 
uh, the, the nature-based solutions performance in, in more technical terms. Um, what we did here is that we invited uh, different people to come talk about, you know, how do they the map the impact of this and also the Im increase of uh, tree cover, heat wave and rainfall as well, runoff mitigation in different cities. So it was it was something interesting. And, and based on that, we are still doing a research on how can we improve this technology. But uh, stay tuned because maybe <laughs> one special issue or a book will come a publication would come about this topic again. So yeah, that is um, that is something that um, we're still as well doing research on. So yeah. Marvellous. Yeah. And I, I, if people are interested in that in particular, I'd point them towards uh, a conversation I had with Nadina Galli yeah. um, about a year or two ago, who, yep. who really focuses on this aspect of technology and nature. So I'll, I'll have a link. Uh, and I'll, I'll have a link to that and to all of your, your papers and your academic profile, uh, whatever we've talked about you know, in the description below. So people have access to that. And uh, yeah, th this has been lovely. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, if people want to learn more about you or get in contact, how can they do that? Uh, you can definitely look for me on LinkedIn. <laughs> it's uh, Isra Mahmoud. And uh, you can look at my profile at uh, my research lab, Laboratorio di Simulazione Urbana. So you can see as well Isra Mahmoud. And uh, I will leave you all the links. And again, it's, Great. you can reach over email. So it's isra.mahmoud at polyme.it. So yeah, it's always me over there. Mm -hmm.